Then morning to the sergeant of the school. Good morning to the Sunday school class. This is New Beginning Church. We are looking at today's lesson, May 21st, Hope Through Stewardship. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We honor you. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another opportunity to study your word. We ask you to bless us as we study your word. Bless your word, Father God, to fall on this soil. Bless your word, Father God, to speak to us that we will have hope, and that this hope will come through stewardship. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. All right, Sister Paul, can you do the aim for change and the keep of mind, keep in mind for us, please? Aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will know the cause of the discipleship. Feel able to recall a time when we realize, we rely on God's power and look for opportunity to serve others. Keep in mind, every, every man has received a gift. Even so, ministry the same one or to another one, as God stood over the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter 4 through 10. Amen. So, in focus, Sister Bunny. Jacob was looking out the window when his mother, Brenda, arrived home. Jaden, what are you doing at the window, she asked. Jaden did not turn to look okay, at her. Okay, hold, hold it for a second. We May 21st, right? In focus. In focus. The mission of will be the mission. In focus will be the mission. and missions, right? And um, the, the author is Peter, and Peter's talking about focusing on stewardship in a way that it would give us hope. And uh, the, the story known as the In Focus was focused on one who was excited about doing missions, right? Excited about doing missions. I mean, we must become excited about missions. When we use the word mission, what are we talking about? When we say mission, what is mission? Mission. Mission. Anybody? Mission? Sorry? Purpose. Helping people. Amen. Helping people. Looking out for those who are usually less fortunate than we are. Right? And our church is New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church. Right, Sister Herman? Yes. New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church. So, we ought to be on the mission field. 
We ought to be sharing Christ as evangelistic people. And we ought to be helping people who are less fortunate than we are. And inviting them, and inviting them to Christ as well as inviting them to the church, right? Yes. So, well, why don't we publicize our church as New Beginning Church? I'm glad you asked. Because when you use the words missionary Baptist, many times you're referring to, most of the time you're referring to black Baptist. So I never wanted New Beginning Church to be a black church. That's why we've had Hispanic, Latino churches meet here and we've had our own Hispanic church. And now we're that great melting pot of Latinos, African-Americans and anybody who will come. Therefore, we are publicized as New Beginning Church. Yes, New Beginning Church. So we ought to be about our missions. The, the story says, and it quotes the scripture, that we have a clarion call. We have a call, and this call that was in Acts 1 and 8 is even relevant today. That once you're saved, once you're born again, once you receive Christ, then the Holy Spirit is present with you and you shall be witnesses. You ought to be witnesses. You ought to tell people about Jesus and you ought to go on a mission field. So the next time we go on a mission, whether it's domestic or foreign mission, then we're looking forward to you being a part of that mission field. Amen? So what is the difference between domestic mission and foreign mission? Is there a difference? When we say domestic mission, when we say foreign mission, what are we talking about? Foreign is more like in other countries. Okay, foreign is international, it is other it includes other countries. What is domestic? Domestic is uh, close around in the US. Okay, domestic is the US. Many times we say domestic, we're talking about home, we're talking about our Jerusalem. That's why the, the, the mission uh, statement is start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, then to the utmost parts of the world. Then we will find there our mission. By the end of this lesson, we ought to know that there's a cost to discipleship. There is a cost. Discipleship costs something. It costs sacrifice. Discipleship will always cost us something. It will always be sacrificial. Jesus sets the standard that we need to have an evangelistic, sacrificial, missionary attitude and ministry. So discipleship costs something. What are some of the things that discipleship costs? What are some of the things that uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book, a little green book, and it's called the cost of discipleship. So what does discipleship cost us? Does it cost you anything? Does it cost you anything? Okay, it doesn't cost you anything financially sometimes, right? Sometimes it does cost us to go on missions, but discipleship, first of all, calls for sacrifice. Discipleship will cost us it's our sacrifice. Discipleship will cause us to neglect things that we want. The discipleship will cause us things that we need. That's why when we go on mission, we always tell individuals, don't give away anything that you don't want and you don't need. That's why when people have clothes that have been used, they say, gently used. Because you need to make sure that you're giving something to others that you would enjoy having. By the end of this lesson, we will realize that God's power is the power that, that sustains us. We're going to feel the fact that God's power sustains us. And finally, we are to look for opportunities to serve others. We have to look for opportunities, gauge, search, seek out opportunities. To serve us. So, Sister so Servant is going to read our scriptures for today. First Peter 4 1 through 11. 
For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For in the past of our life, many sufficed us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. But charity shall cover the multitude of sin. Verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man had received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, Peter lays it all out. The first thing Peter says is that Christ suffered. Christ, even before he died, he suffered. He suffered. They spit on him. They slapped him. They pulled whiskers from his beard. They ultimately killed him. And they killed an innocent man. He was an innocent man. Oftentimes, say three men is noted for dying on the cross. One on the right, one on the left, but the one in the middle was the innocent man. The one on the right was guilty, the one on the left was guilty, but the one in the middle, the man in the middle was an innocent man. They killed an innocent man. Jesus Christ suffered for us. When you look at verses 1 and 2, you see the fact that Jesus Christ suffered. He says that he has suffered. Who? He, Jesus Christ, suffered for us in the flesh. I mean, they pulled plugs out of his skin, plugs out of his body. They whipped him. They set up a false court against him. They beat him unmercifully. They beat him. Jesus Christ suffered for us in the flesh. The good news is, even though he suffered in the flesh, he was suffering for us in the spirit. So physically he suffered in order that we could be made spiritual. Without Jesus Christ suffering, we would not be spiritual. I don't care how much you go to the church. I don't care how much you give tithes and offering. I don't care how much you you um, help other people out. I don't care how neighborly you are. I don't care how hospitable you are. If it had not been for Jesus suffering for us in the flesh, we would not be spiritual women and men. Because Jesus suffered for us, now we are spiritual. He says Jesus suffered for us in the flesh. Then he says, arm yourselves. King James says, arm yourself. This is a military term. And this term saying, get your weapons together. Arm yourself. Get ready for the fight. Let me tell you, it's a fight out here. Amen to that. <laughs> Some writer said, it's like a jungle sometimes. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes. I do mean, all I can do to keep from going out. It's like a jungle sometimes. Another writer says, 
Sometimes I just want to throw up my hands and holler. And Peter is teaching this lesson because he's writing to encourage the suffering Christians. See, there were false prophets around. They were telling them all kinds of things and they were suffering because they had turned to Christianity. So Peter writes this letter to encourage them. Every now and then you need a text message to encourage them. Every now and then you need a letter that may get there next week to encourage you. Every now and then you need somebody to speak a word in your ear to just encourage you. Every now and then when you're going through financial issues, you need somebody somewhere to give you some money. Isn't that amazing? You need somebody to encourage you and tell you, keep on, keep it on. Stay in there. Stay in the race. Make sure you do what you can do. Make sure you do what you can do and keep doing what you're doing. How much does it help you to know that you're doing the right thing? Regardless of what it looks like. Regardless of lack of appreciation, you're doing the right thing. And then when somebody tells you, you're doing the right thing, that gives you more energy to keep doing what you're doing. They'll even tell you, keep doing what you're doing. And those little few words are encouraging you. That's what Peter does for these Christians. Peter tells them to keep the faith that they have and make sure you keep the faith in Christ. He says, arm yourself. As Christ has suffered, yourself must be likewise. In other words, you must have the same mind as Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says in, in Philippians, he says, let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, be willing to suffer for this kingdom's sake. Be willing to suffer for the man who suffered for you. Since Christ has suffered for us, and therefore we must arm ourselves and be willing to suffer also. How many of you were told that once you come to Christ, all your problems will be over? Anybody ever been told that before? Anybody ever believed that? Once I come to know Jesus, all of my issues will be gone. All of my problems will be over. Okay, how many of you know that that's not true? So what's the purpose of coming to Christ? If you got the same problems, if you got the same issues, what's the point of coming to Christ? It helps you to understand what you're going through, and it helps you to get through it. If I got, if I have to go through a storm, I want to go through the storm with Jesus. And guess what? We have to go through storms. We we got. I don't care what you're going through. It's going to be a storm that shows up sooner or later. It's going. I don't care how well you got things laid out and what you got going on, you got together. Sooner or later, a storm is going to hit you. And when that storm hits you, I'm telling you, you need Jesus on your side. Amen. Matter of fact, you need Jesus with you. Amen. So he says in verses 1 and 2 that Jesus has this mind of suffering. And because Jesus has this mind of suffering, we have to understand that we have to suffer too. But look what he says in verse number 1. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, we already know that Jesus had no sin, so he didn't have to cease from sin. So it's talking about those of us who now follow Christ, those of us who are now in Christ. Because we are now in Christ, we ought to be able to cease from sin. We ought to shut sin off. And I know you're still human. I know you still have sin nature. I understand, but you ought not glory in sin like you used to. You ought not seek out sin like you used to. You ought not hang out with sin like you used to. The psalm writer says in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly. Blessed is the man that, that, that does not sit in the presence of of the ungodly. Blessed is the man that does not hold conversation and scorn other people like the ungodly. We are blessed because we have a redeemer who has redeemed us. 
The word redeem means that he has bought us back. Bought with, with cash payment. His cash payment was his blood. He has bought us back. And so now we don't have to give in to sin. Regardless of what the conversations are, you don't have to give in. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, around verses 13 or so, he says that God will give you a way of escape through any temptation. Who will? God will. Jesus had no sin. So we ought to have the, the mindset of suffering and a mindset of becoming sinless. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh of lust of men, but to the will of God. So now since this man, you, have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have to live in the flesh. You may want to write this down for the test. There are three dimensions or three degrees of every man, every saved man. First of all, the natural man. The natural man is a person that's unsaved, that was born unsaved. And Paul says in Corinthians that this man doesn't understand the spirit of God, doesn't understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. He's a natural man. All of us were born as natural men. When I say men, I'm talking about men and women. All of us were born as natural human beings. We had no God. We didn't know him. And to be honest with you, we were dead in our trespasses. The natural man. Then when we get saved, once we're saved, some people become carnal men. In other words, they, they, they are saved, they are born again, and they are on their way to heaven, but they don't act like it. The carnal man still do the things that the natural man used to do. The carnal man still act like he's natural. On Sunday, he's spiritual. On Wednesday, he's spiritual. But during the week, that natural man rises up and the carnal man goes along with it. So he's a, he's a saved person, but he is carnal. The word carnal means fleshly. He's walking in the flesh. But, but the text says you don't have to do that. And then there's a spiritual man. The third degree is a spiritual man. The spiritual man is born again, he's saved, he acts like he's saved, he acts like he's spiritual, he does the things that Christ would have him to do. He is a spiritual man. Says we don't have to walk any longer in the lust of men, but we can walk in the will of God. You don't have to walk in the lust. Lust means desires. You know, some of us can say it a minute, Boy, I remember the good old days. That means that we hadn't turned loose the desire of sin. So we don't have to walk in the flesh. The time is out for us walking in the flesh, but we can walk in the will of God. So we have to understand that since Christ has suffered for us, we as Christians will have to suffer also. So get your mind ready. Peter says, arm yourself. Get your mind ready. Get focused. Prepare yourself. It's a war going on. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, he says there's a war going on in my own self. Paul is spiritual man. Paul, a born again man. He says, I have a war going on in myself. There's a war going on in me. Every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. Every time I do what's right, then evil shows up. What wrong shows up. He says the war going on. When you read Romans chapter 7 in your spare time, you'll see Paul says from verses 14 all the way to verse 24 that there's a war going on within me. I'm a fighting. I'm warring. There's a wrestle between good and evil. And when he gets to verse 24, he says... Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, burden man. Oh, beat down man. Oh, captured man that I am. Who, and he asked the question, who will deliver me from this death of sin? And he answers the question in verse 25. 
Romans chapter 7, verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. He will deliver me. Hallelujah. No one can deliver us but Jesus. Believers should have the same attitude that Christ has. We ought to have the same attitude that Christ has. And the attitude that Christ has is that I got to suffer. I have to go through it. Believers have to know I have to suffer. I have to go through it. We have to have that same attitude. Christ did it all for us. Who did he do it for? All of us. He did it for all of us. And he did all that he did for all of us. We need to do it all for Christ. Don't waste your energy. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your life not living for Christ. Be real about it. Just, just be real and say, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to, Lord, I'm tired of going back and forth, back and forth, swinging back and forth between good and evil, swinging back and forth between godliness and ungodliness. God, as of today, I'm committed to you. I am giving it all to you because Christ gave it all to me. Even though my life may be hard, even though life may not be what we want it to be. Even though life can turn our world upside down. We still should live our lives to please God. Anybody ever had your lives turned upside down? I mean just turned upside, I mean right side down and, and, and downside up. I mean and it can happen in a split second. I mean, you could be doing good in the morning, and by noontime, you're doing terribly bad. And if I have to do terribly bad, I want to do it with Jesus. I want to do it with Jesus. But look at verse number three. For the time passed in our lives, the time passed of our lives, we may suffice, it may suffice us to have wrath in the word, in the will of the Gentiles. In other words, we were satisfied with being ungodly. We were satisfied with, I mean, when I was unsaved, whoo, good God might. I would do what I want to do, say what I want to say, act the way I want to act when I was unsaved. But now I have a calling as a Christian, not as a preacher, not as a pastor, I have a calling to do what is right. To do what is right. I got to do what's right because now I'm saved. And I don't, I didn't get saved to do what's right. I do what's right because I'm saved. Amen. Because without Jesus, I can't do what's right. Can't do it. I'm telling you, I can't do it. I don't know about you now. You may be super Christian. But I just, I just can't do it. Peter tells the Christian, before you became saved, you spent a lot of time in, in your past doing what unsaved people do. He, said, he says to us, we did all these things when we walked in lascivious, lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is, is lusting and carrying out the worst sexual craze of your mind. It is getting out there and just doing what you do. Lust, he calls out lust. Lust is the desire to do it and keep on doing it. It's not just sexual. It's lust is the desire to eat the wrong thing. Desire to be with the wrong people. Desire to not come home. This desire to spend your money on something other than on godliness. Says, don't get involved in excess wine. Let me just be honest and clear with you. It didn't say don't drink wine, but it did say don't drink it to where it's excess. Now, I should not ride down the street one day and see people after so drunk, you're taking out every mailbox down the road. 
I mean, he he playing Donkey Kong with every mailbox. I miss them, but I got to get this some bam. I mean, sloppy laid out drunk. And see, deacons like to tell you, the deacons will tell you this. Deacons will say, you see, the Bible says that you can't drink anything, preacher. But the Bible says that the, the deacon can drink something. The deacon can drink a little bit. But deacon, I see you taking out mailboxes. You about that close to taking out people. So we have to understand, it is clear, don't drink what is excess. One of the commentators said that if Jesus was so far against wine, he wouldn't have turned water into wine. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean you go stock up today. That doesn't mean that when, when you walk in your house, you got one in every room, every corner. Because then you have to concern yourself with causing others to trespass, others to fall, others to trip up. Really, don't be caught up in fights. Don't be a hothead. Don't, don't find yourself fighting. Bad quitting. Now, these, these, this bad quitting in the original Greek was like orgies, where they would do in and everything in the midst of having fun. That's why he, he closes out this list with abominable idolatries. What they would do, they would create their own idols. And as they create their own idols, many of them were sexual babies when they got together. So he says, before you came to Christ, you did all these things. But he suggests and he tells us, whatever you do, stop doing these things. Now, this is a very short list of what God doesn't want us to do now. You do know that, right? Amen. Because people think sinners are only prostitutes, dope dealers, and, and tax collectors and folk like that. But this is a very short list compared to what God really, really, really wants you to stop doing. Anything that is against God is sin. Anything that God does not approve of is sin. He says in verse 4, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them the same, the same excess of riot, speaking evil of them. In other words, there are folk who are going to talk about you when you stop hanging out with them. They, think, they, they speak evil of you. They speak evil, evil of those who love Christ. They speak evil of you. Man, you don't hang out with us anymore. You think you something. You don't got down there and you don't got to be a holy roller. You a Bible thumper now. Don't think it's strange when they start saying stuff against you. Don't think it's strange. It's, it's the usual thing. It's just what they do. They scoff at you. They, they talk about you. They talk about your God. Don't think it's, it's strange. Peter tells Christians before they are saved, they spend a lot of time doing these things. After they are saved, sin doesn't have a rule over their lives. Sin doesn't have that, that guardianship over you. Sin does not have dictatorship over you. The Holy Spirit leads us to do right and to do the right thing. Sin was our taskmaster. Sin was our slave master. But now the Holy Spirit leads us. And as the Holy Spirit leads us, we follow him. Sin. Sin gave us a bad rap. But we've been set free by Jesus. What are some of the things that unsaved young people do. Since we got seasoned folk in the room, let's talk about young folks since they're not here. What are some of the ungodly things young people do? What are some of the sins? Yes, ma'am. Party. They party? Mm -hmm. They're not wrong with a good party. It's just a spot. You don't, you don't mind if we have a good party, do you? Clubbing. Clubbing is a better word. Clubbing. Clubbing. What's the difference in party and clubbing? Going to the club? 
Anything wrong with a good club party? Anybody? So you're saying it's the atmosphere. The atmosphere. What else do, you, do young people do that they ought not be doing? Because I know we can tell them what they ought not be doing. A lot of drugs. Drugs. Yeah. Drugs. All kinds of drugs. All kinds of drugs. Coke is not something you drink anymore. No. <laughs> Crack is not, not a line in the sidewalk anymore. No. What? Ice is not something you cool your drink with anymore. Vomit fluid. <laughs> Mary is Mary Jane is not a not a girl's name anymore. Okay. <laughs> Some writer said, I'm in love with Mary Jane. Said Mary Jane is my mighty type. Oh. <laughs> so Mary Jane is not a woman anymore. So we have to make sure that we worship God in spirit and in truth. He goes on to talk about drunkenness, and then he goes to say, make sure you don't get caught up, like Sister Paul said, in wild parties. Right. Now, Sister Paul, you don't have to go to the club to have a wild party. That's right. So then he finally, he finally says, worshiping idols. Your former friends will think it's strange now about you. Your former friends will think that you you have got to be pious now. But don't you think it's strange? Because you don't do what they do and you don't do what they you used to do. Don't think it's strange that they talk crazy about you. And don't think it's strange when you don't have the taste any longer to do those things. When we are saved, the Bible says, Paul says in Corinthians, he says that once you are saved, when a man is in Christ, he's a new creation, behold all things, and that original Greek word, all things become you, it is all things are becoming you. Meaning that these things are becoming new, step by step. You don't get rid of sin overnight. Not all of them. You, you get rid of sin just like you take your clothes off one piece at a time. But if you get rid of that one, you ought to celebrate God. If you get rid of that little one, you ought to celebrate God. I told a little boy the other day, I said, you just be lying to be lying. You don't even have a purpose to lie. Did you eat breakfast? Uh, 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 he just said, dream of a lie. Because he's trying to figure out why am I asking him, has he eaten breakfast? Am I going to give him some if he say he's already eaten? So he just dreams up a lot. Did you do, did you, did you say that? Uh, uh, I said, man, you just lying to be lying. Stop lying. Let God take that one thing away from you. And whenever God takes that one thing, you ought to rejoice about it. Since you became a Christian, you don't rob banks anymore. You don't shoplift anymore. You don't curse anymore. You don't smoke anymore. You're not disobedient to parents and bosses and, and the, the neighborhood watch captain and all that. You don't do those things anymore since you're in Christ now. We talk about robbing a bank. A guy, a guy was in the bed asleep. Minding his own business. He was asleep. His partner called him about 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning and said, hey, man, you want to go with us? Where y'all going? We're going to rob him. <laughs> Brother Oi, he was sleeping in the bed. <laughs> now, that's one day I advocate him staying asleep. He should not, he should not have woke, should not have awakened all day long. He should have slept to midnight. So they, they all get together. They go to the bank. And this is way before masks were wearing was the popular thing. They go to the bank, and when they get to the bank, they rush into the bank, they lock the doors, and, and then they demand money <laughs> from the customers and the bank operators. They demand money. They didn't know that there was a woman sitting in her car filling out paperwork so she can turn in checks or something. She called the police and said, I just saw some men running the bank. So before they knew it, sooner than quick, and before right now, they were swarmed by police officers. Well, the guys who invited him to go with them, they ran out the back. And they locked the door, and he was left in there. The one that was supposed to be asleep, 
He left in there by himself. The other three or four gone down the street. They got caught too. But they go and left them in there. Let me tell you, Dean Abbott, he should have stayed asleep all day and all night. That show. Sure. <laughs> the guy's calling, because, man, come on, go with us. Where you going, man? We're going to rob a bank. He should have stayed now. That one time he should have let it go to uh, voicemail. Yeah. Or he should have rejected it. <laughs> the Bible says when you meet Jesus, that stuff needs to pass away, Sister Bunny. <laughs> Sister Bunny, I don't want to see you like Bunny and Clyde down there. <laughs> they gonna say, who was the lady? I couldn't see her eyes because she had a hat on. That's Sister Bunny. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Once you are saved, you do not want to do unsaved things. Amen. You don't have that desire anymore. You don't want to do it. And when you do do unsaved things, you will stop and say, Lord, forgive me. And if you have a, a you have, have wronged somebody, you will go to that person and say, please forgive me. Because you want to be right with the Lord. Amen. It's not just for communion. You want to be right with the Lord seven days a week, 366 days a year. You want to be right with the Lord. So don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait till, till first Sunday communion or special days communion come around. Oh, Lord, here I am bringing it to you. You may not make communion. Take it before the Lord. Forgive. Set it right with the Lord. Once you are in Christ, Christ has, feet, has freed you and delivered you from whatever you used to do. Christ has freed you from whatever. He said, don't be a rioter. Don't be speaking evil, verse 4. He says in verse 5, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Let me tell you, we're going to get to a point where we got to give account for everything we do in this life. And the one that is the judge is the one that can judge the quick and the dead. This word quick means the living and the dead. He's judging the living and he's judging the dead. He is the righteous judge himself. We have to make sure that we don't get sad when we get to a point in our lives where we turn right and go straight. Don't be sad because you can't hang out with them. Don't be upset because you have turned over a new leaf. Because God will judge the quick and the dead. Look at verse number six. Four, four. This cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead and that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. You will be judged as a dead person. You will be judged. But God is calling us to live for God right now. If we live for God right now, we don't have to worry about the judgment. When you look at Romans chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 13, you will find that there is no law set against the righteous one. But then, let me tell you, when somebody is guilty, every time police car, car is seen, they slow down, they almost park on the side of the road. Ooh, there's, there's old John Law right there. When you're guilty, the Bible says in Proverbs that the guilty will run when nobody's chasing them. Wow. I looked back on the camera and I saw the guys that pulled all the electricity out of the ground here at the church. When a car came down the road, the car wasn't even stepping out of them, but they jumped behind the air unit hmm. and took 3,000 feet of carpet out of the ground. They were guilty. 
That car passed by here 75 miles an hour. They weren't studying them, but they were guilty. And when you're guilty, every time you see somebody or you see the cops, you're going to run over. Run over to the side. You can tell when a police is in a, in a, in a procession. You can be driving down I-10 and all of a sudden you go from 75 to 55, from, from 55 to 45, even though it's a 65 mile an hour zone, you know the police up there. Because you get up there and everybody's creeping. You ought to give them a ticket for holding up traffic. He knows it. They're just creeping. They, they see the police, they just, just slam on brakes. It says, for this cause was the gospel preached. The gospel of Jesus Christ was preached. And it is preached to everyone. Before the world comes to an end, everybody on the earth would have heard the gospel. Those who are dead and those who still are alive will hear the gospel. God is a just God. God is a just God and he will judge every one of us. Well, Peter is born and only dead, isn't he? He's the judge. Everyone will be given account to God for everything they do. Every idle word will be brought into judgment. We will be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. We're going to be judged one day. <clears throat> Verse 8, and above all these things have fervent charity. What is charity? Charity. What is charity? Charity. What is charity? What does the word charity mean in this particular verse? Huh? Love. It says, whatever you do, have fervent love. Be, be on fire for love. And yeah, you ought to give it to other folk. Be on fire to give love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. We know love covers a multitude of sins, though. Because Jesus set the standard. And because Jesus has set the standard, we ought to make sure that we show love and follow Jesus' standard. Verse 9 says, use hospitality one to the other without what? Without being grudged. That's why, that's why when we read King James, he says, he says, let him give, not out of necessity, nor grudgingly. God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, show hospitality cheerfully. Be excited about it. Be excited about showing love and hospitality. I believe our church is one church that shows hospitality to everybody. Yes? Anybody. Regardless of race, creed, color. We ought to be a church that shows love, show hospitality, be hospitable to any single person. And not just in the church, but in the streets. Our church ought to be known throughout the city of Houston, throughout the state of Texas, throughout the United States, as that church that has love and that church that shows hospitality. That's why first time visitors get a call from me, and when I call them, I want to know how your experience started that. How was your experience? What, what did you get from the service other than the, the word of God? I'm so glad you got the word of God, but I also want to know, were we hospitable to you? And every single time, except one I know, every single time the person said, oh, that group of people were so nice and so kind. And the one time the lady told me, it wasn't our fault, it was her fault. Amen? Because you know, if you look for something, you'll find it. Amen. If you look for it long enough, you'll find it. Verse 10. As every man has received the gift, every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to the other. If you receive a gift, minister by way of that gift. And this word minister means service. 
This word minister doesn't mean to preach. Doesn't mean you better gotta be called a pastor. I always, I always tell people when they come to me and say, hey, I'm called to preach. And I, I know your history. I said, no, God calling you to get your life right. But God been bothering me all night long. I know he's calling me to preach. No, he's calling you to get right with God. And then he could call you to preach. There are so many preachers all over the world, including me, who have a bad past. But we have to come to God and let him get it right. We couldn't get it right on our own. We have to come to God and let him get it right. So we must minister the gift that God has given us. I'm telling you, God has given us gifts. And whatever gifts you want, you have, you use that gift. How many people here got more than one gift? Give me two gifts that you have. Giving and health. Giving and health. Okay, anybody else? Okay, we don't have to donate y'all some gifts for y'all these days. <laughs> anybody else has, has anything that, that God has, the Bible said that God has given all of us the gift. And what God has given you, you need to be used. Anybody else? Anybody else got any gifts? Actually, I have three. I have discernment. Discernment. So when I came to preach at the New Beginning Church and they were looking for a pastor, Sister Irvin would look at me like this. She was checking me out. She discerned me. <laughs> so what did you discern, Sister Irvin? I knew you would be the one. <laughs> oh, she knew I was. She knew more than I did. You paid her, Pastor I didn't pay her. <laughs> but she had picked me out, she had poked me out, she had looked me over. Because she has a spirit of discernment. So you have to use it. As good stewards of the manifest grace of God, we are to be good stewards by utilizing our gifts. Because God has given us manifold grace. What is the author talking about when you say he's given us manifold grace? Brother Or, what does the manifold do on a car? What does it look like? Okay, <laughs> the manifold quiet the noise. What, what does it look like? Okay, what did you say, Sister? I said many sides. It's got many different connections, right? So, the Lord says it's a straight pipe, right, that leads out the back. But before you get to the back, you've got manifolds that come off the meaning, many of them, right? right? God has given us manifold grace. This morning was a grace. Yes. Last night was a grace. Yes. The Bible said every day new mercies he gives. Some people got up in their right mind and some didn't. Right. Some people didn't go to bed last night, some did. Amen. Some people didn't go to bed and didn't get up either. Right. <laughs> Somebody hit the lottery last night and many of y'all did. So I'm not going to tell you that with me. I'm just here doing the Lord's will. Are you with me? So, we have to understand that God has given us manifold grace. We are existing. We are living in the midst of manifold grace of God. Many grace. And that's why I know everybody in this room has a gift that they ought to be using. Verse number 11. If any man speaks let him speak. Now he's talking about these gifts. If you are called to speak, speak. If any man speak, let him speak. The oracles of God. If any man minister, let him minister. It has the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The ultimate goal is to glorify God. Whatever you call to do, whether it's discernment, whether it's gifts, whether it's giving. Boy, I like all the ones that Sister Irvin got. I'm going to have to draw close to her so I can get some of Big Daddy's money. <laughs> She's a giver. <laughs> she likes helping. And she can watch my back because she's going to watch for dessert. I got to make a deal with Big Daddy so I can see <laughs> if he would allow her to be my security officer. In my CFO. Amen. If any man speaks, let him speak 
as unto the oracles of God. Speak according to the gift that God has given you. Speak God's word. It says to us that we have manifold gifts. If a man is given the ability to speak, let him speak. If a man is given the ability to minister, let him minister. All things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The ultimate goal is to glorify Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our gifts that we have should be used faithfully to serve others. God is the one who gave us our gifts. Who gave them to you? God. Who should you use them? God. You should glorify God. Since God gave them to us, we should use them to glorify him and help others. What is your gift? How are you using your gifts to glorify God and help others? What are some of the things that our youth do to glorify God here in our church? Playing instruments, singing, skits, puppets, robotics, hydroponics, aquaponics. What are they really doing? Serving others. What are some of the gifts that are listed in verse number 11? Ministering, speaking. Glorify God. We, we do all these things to glorify God. These are manifold gifts. Anything else? Does anybody have questions or comments? Whatever you gifts you have, do it to the best of your ability. There may be somebody listening to me that do not feel like they have a gift. Maybe someone listening who never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is your moment. Just bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life. Believing that he died for your sins, he was buried on in a borrowed tomb, and he rose from the dead. Just repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed this prayer, we believe that you are now born again. You are on your way to heaven. You need to get busy using the gift that God has given you. Make sure you're a good steward of what God has done for you. And make sure that you give hope and that you have hope through stewardship. It is often time, time for us to give to God through tithes, often in sacrificial gifts. We thank God for blessing us, so now we want to, to bless God. Amen. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless them in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this word, Father God. We ask you to bless us to have hope, that our hope will be through serving, through stewardship, through helping others, we pray, Father God, that you give us a spirit of discernment so we can know who really needs help and that we will go forward in helping them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for joining us. Please come by and join us at 1030 for our 1030 a.m. service every Sunday. Join us on Wednesday night for 715 for our Bible study. And then join us again as you have joined us today at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning for Sunday school. God bless you.